Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Hinox Practice Room. Uh, today we are honored to have the great singer Waina with us. Waina, welcome. Thank you, Anna Gie. Thank you so much for agreeing to, to be here. My pleasure, all my pleasure. Thanks. So some of the questions that I'm going to ask you, uh, I'm sure you've been asked a lot of times, but you have to it's be okay. patient with us. No, not <laughs> And some mind. of the stuff, as much as we know uh, each other for a long time, yeah. I don't know the, some of the facts. Like, sure. right, so we go back all the way back. Right. So uh, you were born here? I was born here, yeah. And uh, my mom and I immigrated to the States when I was three. Okay, and, and uh, so uh, how, did, uh, how did you get interested in music in the beginning, at the very, at the I very mean, beginning? I was always interested in music. They told me that back in the day when they would play traditional songs on the TV, when there was just one channel, I would put my Nadella on and dance for everybody. <laughs> so there was always uh, that desire in me. And my aunt had this uh, split level house where there was a staircase leading up to the next floor. And I used to pretend that was my stage. And I, I would have the whole family sit and watch me and I would just perform, dance, sing, whatever. So from very young that there was that desire. No stage fright. Oh no, I, I okay, so that's interesting <laughs> you said that. Mm -hmm. So I remember my first big show when I was about, I don't know, maybe eight or nine. And I remember being backstage and, and all I felt was excited. I was like, I can't wait to show them how good we are. Like, it, it, I was like bursting, like I couldn't wait to get on stage. Uh, but then later, as I got older and a little more self-conscious, you know, the world kind of beats you down a little bit. So, it, you know, things get drilled into your head that aren't always positive. And so I was battling some of those demons when I would go on stage. But pretty much once I got into a rhythm, I could relax and and every over the years I've learned more and more how to just let go and it's like it, it's honestly become the one place where I feel free and I really cherish it and if I don't do it I feel like I'm missing something you know you know I've, I've noticed the change yeah you know from the beginning now you're right. a really a, a great performer not yeah. only the singing but yeah. as a performer yeah. to really entertain the crowd yeah. and keep them captivated and engaged on you yeah so that's that has i've seen it change a lot so thank that's you. wonderful thank you so nobody in the family is a musician or no nobody my, you're my the first dad was a civil engineer my mom was a word processor they're both pretty shy and not really craving audience attention at all so I'm, I'm actually also reserved myself off, off stage, so. So yeah. music is like an outlet for you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like playing a character, sort of. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> like your my superhero comes out. Oh, Great. Stage. That's how it feels. So uh, you went <laughs> to elementary school, uh, high school. Did you play in a? Did you go to church or play in a choir or play in a high school band or anywhere you got involved in music? Yeah, so in our in, in Rockville, Maryland, where I grew up, there was a community theater and I, I was always in the children's uh, review every summer. In school, I was in chorus. And then later, I started playing oboe, which was a lot of fun. And, huh. um, and then it really wasn't until I got to University of Maryland and I joined the University of Maryland Gospel Choir that it just kind of clicked. Like my, my initial background was musical theater and I loved the storytelling and the lyrical, um, visual lyrics. Uh, but then when I, when I got exposed to gospel, that's when the, the soul and the emotion and the, the healing of music really, beca it became a, a, a purpose and a, a, a higher mission. You know. So what was your major at uh, the University, at University of Maryland? Of Maryland. Yeah. I studied um, English and speech communication. So I'm thinking maybe by this time you still haven't decided to become a professional musician. No, I, I always, I mean, from the time <laughs> I was this well, I was that was it. And I always wanted to do that. Again, you know, we left the Ethiopia to have a, a, a good life in the States. And mm -hmm. it was just drilled into me from the time I was young. Education, education, education. You have to be a professional. And so I, I just, you know, my mom wanted me to be a lawyer and that was sort of the path I was going down. But honestly, it was never in my heart and, and she knew it too. It was just, I think we had to go through the motions <laughs> before yeah. she understood that this was something that wouldn't go away. Otherwise you knew from the beginning that you were gonna perform. Absolutely. Okay. Great, so you come out of school 
What yeah. efforts from the university and then? So I did an internship at the White House and I, I, we went to the president's office and met his speechwriters and there was a very nice guy there. He was the first African American to ever serve as a presidential speechwriter. And he was so low key and humble and I just liked him immediately. And he told us about the internship program. So I applied and I became his uh, researcher, his intern. And I did that for six months. And then after the president got reelected, uh, President Clinton got reelected, I got a job there. And I worked there for three years, writing presidential letters, messages, proclamations, some video scripts. Um, so, and it was, it was really, I mean, it was an amazing time, but I was very clear, even from the beginning, that this was not my passion. You know, mm -hmm. I was proud and my mom was proud and I was excited and inspired by the people I was working with because they were brilliant. Uh, and I believed in the administration, but it was, I was always like, I, I had a, a Friday night gig in Georgetown and I would like, I couldn't wait to get to that gig every Friday night. So you're still very active in the scene. In it the took scene. a minute. It took a minute for a while. I, I had to focus on my job. And then after a while I did. And I used to sneak out during lunchtime. There was a, a Kemp Mill Records and sometimes artists would come and do in stores. And I would go during lunchtime and I saw a lot of my favorite artists there and just to get inspired and then I'd go back to my office. And so during those days, for you to go to work was going to the White House? Misery, yes. White House? Yes. You're, you're working the White House? Yeah. I mean, I took yeah. the subway and uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And you met the president a few, few I times. I did, yeah. <laughs> and he was very kind and he, was, he cared a lot about Ethiopia and I remember That's asking Bill him. That's Bill Clinton, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I remember asking him when he was going to go and he just, he knew a lot, he knew everything, you know, and he cared and he, he cared about every, like, you, I was an intern when I first met him and he went out of his way to talk to me, you know, so I think he was that kind of person, just a humble, like, a guy who liked everybody. So uh, after that, what's the next thing? After the internship in the White House, then what, what happened next? So I started working for this Ethiopian organization. It was the first political action committee for Ethiopian Americans. And um, it was very exciting. We did a bunch of uh, political fundraisers for people who were running on the state, local, and uh, national level. And again, I was like, um, the pull to be creative was so great that it surpassed my fear. You know, I had fear. I knew what I wanted, but I was still scared. You know, what if um, it doesn't turn out the way I want? What if I'm not as good as I think I am? What if, you know, it's not received well, you know? And it was very risky walking away from a career that was headed somewhere. You know, I could have, my cousin asked me on this trip, he was like, if you didn't stop uh, writing, where would you be now? And I just said, unfulfilled, you know, because the truth was I was headed toward a trajectory where that I could have maybe been in a very good position and it was risky walking away from that but happiness and fulfillment I think are more important than I mean clearly more important than prestige or anything that might make your family proud I'll say amen to that amen <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah I have my story is sort of similar that's why right. and and um, so after that uh, you started gigging in the city what happened how did you get into the scene yeah, so yeah. I um, I started doing a few gigs, but I mean it was really it was really Thomas. I mean I I, I met brother. your brother Thomas, mm -hmm. and um, you know he was asking me about writing, and and at the time he was working with Gigi, and mm -hmm. I was just I started jamming with you guys, right? Mm -hmm. You were you mm -hmm. had you had mm -hmm. a gig downtown, mm -hmm. and I remember jamming with you guys. I remember the first day we met mm -hmm. and being you know so humbled and uh, excited to meet you and going to Abogaz's studio for the first time and. Thomas and our guys really took me under their wing and they said just like lay down all the songs you ever imagined like mm -hmm. just get them all out and we went through them and they picked the ones that were the strongest and we started recording and we, we completed a handful of songs and then from there I, I started working with other producers in the area and by um, within a couple years the album was done and then I released my first album Moments of Clarity in 2004 and then was I started Was that the gigging. one that was nominated for a Grammy? No, actually. The, the one after that? The one after that, yeah. Okay, so right. that was the 2004, then 2008 I did Higher Ground. Okay. Um, yeah, but it was on that run when we were performing that Loving You, which was nominated for a Grammy, came about because okay. we were opening for Common at uh, Dream Night Club, this old club back in the day. And, okay. and he had a DJ and 
we um, we didn't have a band, so I was like, let's just somebody beatbox and I'll sing a song. And so my buddy Dub, W. Ellington Felton, shout out to him, he he beatbox and we did Loving You and the crowd just went crazy. And so I said, all right, we have to record this. And thank God we did. Okay, that's great. Um, that's wonderful. And um, uh, your uh, speech writing, mm -hmm. uh, did it help with the lyric writing? Is there a connection? Or, yeah. or you're always good with words? Oh, no, it definitely helped. But it's a different kind of writing. But mm -hmm. um, it helped in that I learned to take criticism. Because when you're writing professionally, your stuff gets hacked all the time and you just can't attach your ego to it. And that was preparation for being a songwriter because it just, your same thing happens when you write songs. Mm -hmm. And even though it's sometimes hard to um, build yourself back up when mm -hmm. you get uh, you know, criticized, it's usually a learning experience and you get better every time. And so now I have the ability to detach myself from something I've written. Uh, maybe sometimes I struggle, struggle yeah, a little bit, yeah. but for the most part, I have that ability because I was a, a writer. It's difficult for a lot of artists once they commit something yeah. to detach themselves from it. So, so that's good that to have that, you know, yeah. that sense, you know, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a science. It's not a. It's not just there. There is a a, a method to um, making wonderful music, and you have to um, be open and humble to learning from the people around you and then you get better and then also it's not about you I, th I think that's another thing that I've learned in the past year is that it this is a gift and offering to the audience and then the audience does with it what they want and you have to let go in order for it to have impact mm -hmm. so the the higher ground uh, album was nominated for a Grammy right that must be very exciting uh, yeah. time at that oh, point yeah I was, was so, well, I was so thrilled I mean it was a life uh, life changing experience and i feel you know grateful my ma my manager at the time was um, very skeptical and i remember his exact words were to me when i told him i submitted his exact words to me were christmas isn't coming early mm -hmm. and he told me you know labels pay millions of dollars for things like this and mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. going to happen but it did and i think the lesson i took from that is you know you never know how god can open a door and uh, I think our job is to always believe for the biggest that we can imagine dream the biggest we can imagine and let the universe do everything within our power and let the universe do the rest uh, because there are lots of naysayers who will say things aren't possible but they don't know everything is possible at any time and it's never too late so I was uh, traveling in South Africa for my girlfriend's wedding, and I knew that the nominations were going to be announced. We were in a, a remote area outside of Cape Town, so the Wi-Fi was kind of sketchy. And I went to a hotel just to check my MySpace. That's how long ago it was, <laughs> I was checked my MySpace. And um, I, was, I was like waiting for my husband to come um, from the um, lobby to so that we could look together and then I just opened up a message somebody said congratulations and I was like no and then <laughs> I went to the <laughs> Grammy site and I just clicked in my my name and it popped up and I was like I remember my husband came out and I was like ah. he was like what <laughs> you know? so we were just celebrating in that lobby in South Africa and we had you know an, a wonderful weekend celebrating with my friend and came back and celebrated with everyone else so while you are, you're having all this music career thing going on, at the same time you got married and had two kids, right? Yeah, yeah. And when did that happen? A while back? I got married before I ever started doing music and I'm really glad that it happened that way because it was like that part of my life was sort of figured out and I had the bandwidth to go through all of the other emotional ups and downs that come with a musical career. So, so yeah, you had a great uh, foundation. Absolutely. Home base, so to, no to doubt do. about it. Okay. No doubt about it. That's great. And two kids? Yeah. Almost same age as my kids. Yes, yeah? exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. 13 and 9. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. Zema and Beza. Zema and Beza. They're named... Uh, you know, one means redemption, one means song, so it's like Bob Marley tribute. <laughs> redemption song. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, so, um, and then he got busy with the music scene, he started playing gigs a lot of places. Right. That went on, and then another big thing in your life, I think, is when you met Stevie Wonder, right? Right, right? Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So we were playing, me and Tomas were playing in L.A. and we were opening for a friend of mine, Ayana Gregory, who's the daughter of Dick Gregory, longtime civil rights activist and good friend of Stevie's. 
And so he came to see her show and I was on right before her. And when he went to introduce her, he said some kind words about me, which I immediately put in my bio. <laughs> <laughs> you but, have to use what you exactly, have to get. whatever you get. Yes, yes. Uh, but then he also, um, you know, he invited us over and wanted to meet us. And it's the strange thing that he just makes everyone feel at ease. So I've been more nervous around other artists that but he has this power to just make you relax. And so I felt like, you know, a friend, like I had mm -hmm. met a friend. And uh, we kept in touch. And um, over the years, you know, I had, I had had my first daughter and I was really like at home, pretty much just taking care of her and slowly getting back into music. But it was quite a, it was a bit tricky. And um, actually my second daughter, sorry, it had, it had Zima. And he called and said that they were on the road and did I want to join? And, you know, my daughter was just one. Uh, and so it was, I, I just immediately said yes. And then, and then I called my husband. I was like, I'm going, right? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, of course you're going. Mm -hmm. and, so, um, and so I joined his band uh, for the Songs in the Key of Life tour, which is my favorite album of all time. So for was, a lot of people, yes. Yeah. So. yeah. So it was an incredible experience, and I call it genius school. Not only him, but all the musicians who were all incredible. Uh, and so it really, I, I learned, it was like my music school. Like, you know, you, you went to Berkeley. I, I, this was, a lot of the band members went to Berkeley, actually. So it was like watching how they conduct themselves, how they practice constantly. I, I think uh, working with someone like Stevie or yeah. anybody or other professional musicians who played with them, right is I think better than any schooling you can get. I think it's more than anything. That's what I feel like because mm. that's really the real life and also hands on on, on, the, on, the, on, job on, the, on the job training. Right. I think it's, you can't get that anywhere. You can't get yeah. that. Certain things you can get from school, but you can't get that right. from anywhere. So you're lucky. Maybe think, to so, like that. maybe yeah, so. I think so, I think so. So I'm sure, uh, 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 what are the lessons you learned from, mm. you know, looking at TV, how on being on stage, performance-wise, mm. or other thing that you can take for yourself? Sir. He was never afraid to make a mistake. And he would mess up sometimes and laugh about it. And yeah. Other people would mess up, he would laugh. Yeah. Uh, it was a loving, So a risk safe. taker, he was yes, a risk taker. Yes, absolutely. He, he loved challenging people and challenging himself. Um, he would, and he the, he has this other instrument that he plays that he was sort of learning all, while he was performing. And his band members would talk about how he would play wrong notes all the time, and he would just giggle, <laughs> keep going, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I learned, you know, just to not take everything so seriously. Um, and but at the same time, there was a, a commitment to excellence that all the musicians had. They worked really hard, and as talented as they were, and as accomplished as they were, they. They played all the time. So, and even Stevie would practice. He would warm up for like an hour and a half or two before his show. He was he was still practicing. At, so this, at this age. At that age, at that level of the, you know, excellence, yeah. yes, he would still practice and challenge himself to learn new instruments, to learn new runs. Whenever a good um, instrumentalist would come, he would want to battle them in a friendly way mm -hmm. to sharpen sharpen mm -hmm. his skill. You know. Mm -hmm. And the musicians were the same way. And sometimes we would have a long travel day, and I would uh, get home at like we'd get to the hotel at like ten, and I'd be walking in the hallway, and I hear the trombone player practicing at ten p.m. after traveling for a whole day. So it's just that um, commitment. commitment to the art, yes. the craft, yes. improving the craft, yes. discipline, hard working, absolutely, all those things, absolutely. So at that level, still, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then some of the musicians are like. Uh, Nate Watts, he's been with TV for many years, and yes. like Greg Flingens is yes. like on everybody's album. He's done thousands of recordings in the studio with all the famous singers. Yes, but he still like work uh, ethic wise. Yes, it's right there. Precise. Yeah. If if anyone was late for sound check, it was like unacceptable. You know, every I, the expectation was. This I think is that's serious. a very good lesson for all of us, for yeah. all all younger musicians and us yeah. also like what it takes to be on that level Absolutely. and still maintain that also. Yes. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. well, you know, is there anything else that I haven't uh, asked you, you want me to, to talk about? Well, or or for younger uh, aspiring singers or musicians or, yeah. or anything, anything you want to say well, in your experience? Thank you. I, I would love to talk about the video that I recorded here last year, which we did at Fendika, is for the song I Won't Answer, which you guys brilliantly played. Um, mm -hmm. And I just, um, 
it's just a it's a it's an important story about identity and really what Ethiopia means to me what my what my mom gave to me the pride in our culture and the foundation that it is in in my life and I just want folks to uh, you know see to check out the video share it but more so resonate with the the idea of the name the power in a name what the strength and the the um, identity that it gives us and how we we should always honor that and celebrate it and make sure others, per, you know, do too. There was a story that you told me. It's, I just want the audience to hear, like somebody like who's a, a legend and icon all over the world, like Stevie Wonder. Uh -huh. uh, tell us, the, tell the audience a story about when you took him to eat at uh, in, in Virginia, that story. So we were uh, performing for the funeral of Dick Gregory and Stevie, uh, well, you know, we had finished and I asked him, do you want to eat in Jeddah? He said yes. So I called uh, Salamino, shout out to Salamino, the great. The great guitar player. Yes, of Mohawk guitar band, player. legendary. Uh, and asked him if, uh, if we could go to Injera, uh, this amazing restaurant in Virginia. And so he welcomed us there and we were eating and um, enjoying our food. And then um, Abagaz came. Uh, and you know, as a surprise, I didn't know he was coming. I hadn't seen him in so long, and I was so excited that I and I wanted Stevie to know this is a special person. So I said, "This is the Quincy Jones of Ethiopia," and I just jumped out of my chair and ran over to him. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to greet him for a little while, and then I'll take him uh, to meet Stevie. Uh, but before I could even finish, Stevie got up and walked over to him with his you know, right hand guy and, and wanted to meet him, asked to be introduced. And so I had like this like moment where I was like, oh my God, it's here, Stevie, why is here? I'm like, eh. And you know, he was so gracious and, you know. Very humble. I mean, so, so humble, yeah, he got yeah. up out of his chair I'm to go sure and meet. I'm sure all the time people go to Stevie to all meet the him. Time. He never get, gets up and goes there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so. And it also shows his appreciation for other kinds of music, world music that he Open really to did. everything. Absolutely. In fact, he, it, he's, it's curious, a, a love, a respect for it. And um, I just, those are all the things that I, I mean, there are a million things that I learned, but humility and curiosity are, are two that stand out. I think that, that you get also. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I really do. And uh, thank you very much for being here. So next time you come here, maybe for a longer time, then we can spend more time and do this again. Thank you, Haneke. Thank I'm you so, so much. Um, honored to be with you. Same and here. proud of you. And uh, thank you so much for everything you've done for me. Same here, Wena. All right. <laughs>